Retro Static Radio proudly takes pleasure in bringing you a parade of outstanding thrillers, sci-fi, and horror. The most notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented to bring you to the edge of your chair to keep you in... Suspense. April 1st, 1900. Dear Bessie, this is just to let you know that I've arrived in Pilotsville. Lizzie met me at the station. She's heartbroken about Papa's bankruptcy and feels, for some reason, that it's up to me to remedy our family situation. I told her that I had been offered a job, but swept away that idea in horror. A girl with your looks, Amanda Peabody, doesn't have to get a job. There's plenty of rich husbands around here. Furthermore, she already said she has a rich husband lined up for me right here in Pilotsville. Don't you remember? I told you about him at Christmas time. He's a Mr. Evans, as rich as anything. Charming, cultured... A lonely widower with two wonderful dear children. And besides that, he is just your type. A real intellectual. You should just hear him play the pipe organ. And you know, Bessie, I've met so few interesting men lately that I'm kind of intrigued. And all you have to do is lift your little finger. Mr. Evans? Oh, good evening, Mrs. Chumley. How delightful to see you here. I'd like you to meet my sister, Mr. Evans, my sister Amanda Peabody. Mm, delighted, I'm sure. It's a lovely party, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Miss Peabody. Have you just come to Pilotsville? Yes, she's down from New York, visiting me, after that whirl of the hectic social season. Oh, indeed. I'm sorry, I'm afraid our Pilotsville society must seem a bit dull to you. Oh, no, not at all. It's charming. I've enjoyed so much tonight. Your beautiful house, the music. I hear you're going to play for us tonight. Oh, a little bit. Do you care for organ music, Miss Peabody? Oh, very much. I never miss a church recital. What a luxury it must be to have a pipe organ right here in your house. Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't do without it. It's my hobby, you know. Bach, Beethoven, Caesar Franche. Don't you just enjoy their works? Oh, Amanda's very musical. You should hear her render the burning of Rome. <laughs> yes. And the delightful thing about having a pipe organ in the house is that it's everywhere. To sit at the keyboard and feel the walls, the ceiling, the floors vibrate... You see, Miss Peabody, I've had the pipes installed all over the house. Under this floor, for example, is all the choir stops. Up in the bedroom are the stops for the swell manual, the 32-foot pedal stops, the great diapason are under the front stairs. My children <laughs> sleep next to the echo chamber. So you see, we live like angels here, in a paradise of music. How fantastical. <laughs> Ladies... Why don't you come to the second floor landing with me, and I can show you the main console. It was custom made for me in Vienna. <laughs> April 7th, 1900. Bessie, dear, to tell you the truth, I find him so fascinating. I wish you could hear him play. It'd sweep you off your feet. There's such wildness to it, and yet, at the same time, such dignity. And to hear the sound all through that marvelous house, rolling through those gorgeous rooms, with their beautiful tapestries and potted palms, I could listen to him all night. You have the most amazing eyes, Miss Peabody. What are you thinking about? The music. Oh, please don't stop. It's so beautiful. Well, you seem to be as mad about music as I am. Your sister said that you played too. Oh, no. Only a little. 
My appreciation of it is inside, I'm afraid. If one can't play, it's better to just enjoy the music of others. Ah, the idiotic tunes people play nowadays. Give me the old stern classics. They have strength. They have power. Give me something with life to it. Something to flood the whole house with sound. Oh, that was marvelous. You're a very unusual girl, Miss Peabody. Quite unlike the girls down here in Pilotsville. In what way? It's... it's hard to explain. More tea, Amanda? No, thank you. You have an excellent cook, Mr. Evans. Oh, please, please, call me Theodore. You promised. Theodore. Amanda. And your house is beautifully run, too. You must have a wonderful housekeeper. Everything always looks so charming and quiet. I haven't even heard a peep out of your children. My children? Oh, yes. The children have been away at school. You have two, haven't you? Yes. Daphne and David. What sweet names. Usually I don't approve of schools for young children, but you see, they were rather overwrought when... when Mrs. Evans passed on. I can very well understand that. They were almost morbidly devoted to their mother, and then the unfortunate circumstance of her death, but... I suppose your sister, Mrs. Chumley, has told you all about that. Not very much, I'm afraid. Except that she was killed in a street accident, wasn't yes, she? Yes, in Philadelphia. A brewing wagon and four horses ran her down. Oh, how terrible. It's something I don't like to think about very often. Poor, beautiful Margaret. It's like a nightmare, Amanda. And I still can't feel reconciled, but... But what I was driving at is that the children, they were in school when she died, and by some malicious stroke of fate, there was an epidemic of scarlet fever raging up there. The authorities wouldn't lift the quarantine and let them out for her funeral. Oh, the poor little things. Yes, it upset them dreadfully. In fact, I fear it left a mark on them that may endure with them all their lives. What do you mean? They suffer from delusions. Delusions about her. They think in some way she's linked. Her her soul is imprisoned in the pipe organ. How horrible. I wish I could do something about it. It's a frightful notion. But they won't let me play when they're home. The echo chamber in particular, the one next to their room. Yes? You know it's nothing but an empty sealed room with a few wires. Of course it's all because they never saw her dead. But they have a notion that she's... Somehow, hidden there. Oh, how utterly ghastly. They really think that, do they? Hmm. Children can think up some strange things in their little minds, can't they? April 18th, 1900. I met the children today, Bessie, for the first time. It was a shock. They're strange little creatures, utterly unlike their father. The girl is about eleven and the boy eight. They were both dressed in deep mourning. Their large gray eyes seemed strained with terror. They listened and trembled at every sound. This is Mrs. Peabody, children. She's a very good friend of mine. Now I want you both to shake hands with her. Come now, Daphne. You can at least tell Miss Peabody how old you are. Oh no, please don't press her. I know when I was a little girl I'd hate how people talked about my age. I'd much rather hear about, well, about school. We're not going back there. No matter what anyone says. David! It's all right. Then you didn't like school? No, and Mommy didn't like it either. She cried when we went away. Oh. But your mama wanted you to be educated, didn't she? She wanted you to grow up and be intelligent people, didn't she? Well, didn't she, Daphne? Who are you? You may call me Aunt Amanda. I'm a friend of your papa's. Do you know where my mama is? Your mama? Well, your mama's in heaven. No, she's not. Then where is she? Please, please not now, Amanda. It's too upsetting. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music, like old times. You remember when your mother was alive, we all used to play together. 
David, you with your cornet, Daphne with your violin, and your mother at the piano. It so happens that Miss Peabody plays the piano, too. She promised to play Narcissus with us today, Mama's favorite piece. Well? Perhaps some other time, when they're not feeling so strange. Nonsense. I've humored them to death. Come now, David. There's your cornet on the mental and Daphne. No. I insist. Look now, I've started the melody on the organ. David, you come in with your cornet obbligato in the third measure. What's that? Come along, children. That... that note. Making that funny noise. What no? Oh, you mean that? That's just a cipher. A wire must have stuck somewhere in the pipe valves. It's Mama. That's where Mama is. She's calling for us. Now don't be silly, Daphne. I'll just hit the key a few times and it'll stop. You've heard it before, right, Miss Peabody? Well, I... I don't know about pipe organs. It's just a common technical occurrence, but very annoying, of course. What is she doing in there? Why doesn't it stop? That's where she is. She's stuck in the pipe and can't get out. Daphne, stop this nonsense. Oh, hush, dear. Your papa will fix it. No, he won't. He can't. She won't let him because... because he killed her. Daphne. Daphne, what did you say? <laughs> she didn't mean it, I'm sure. The poor little girl's hysterical. We should never have tried to persuade them. Amanda, just because they never saw her face. They never saw her lying there in the casket. My own children think me a murderer. <laughs> Theodore, you're making them both sick. <laughs> I, who loved their mother so much, so devoted for twelve years. Do I look like a murderer, Amanda? Do I? No. Shh, dear. I'll take the kids upstairs, Theodore, while you try to fix it. April 24th. Oh, Bessie, those poor little children... We took them out to the cemetery today to show them her grave. A marble angel guarded it. It was planted with pure white tulips. How final it was, and peaceful. Yet the kids began to tremble again, not at the cemetery, but when we set foot into the house. Poor Theodore. The man is nearly out of his mind. What can he do? I keep asking myself that question. She died in Philadelphia, you say? Yes. May 15th. Less than a year ago. You weren't with her? No, no. She went there to take a piano lesson with a new teacher. She was always so self-conscious about her technique. But she never reached his studio. They notified me at midnight from the city morgue. And no one in Philadelphia saw her? No one. Well, except for the attendants at the morgue and the people who picked her up after that collision. It was such a brutal accident, Amanda. Could there be anyone from them to talk and explain to the children? Oh, no, no. It's so horrible, so sordid. I know, my dear. I hate to make you suffer. But if we could find some way, if they could just believe, when you brought her back here to Pilotsville, was there anybody then who saw her? No, I... I couldn't bear it. I... I didn't think at the time. She'd been so beautiful. Her loving face, her brilliant eyes. The horses had just completely trampled... It, oh. Even if the children had been able to come home, I wouldn't have let them look. The coffin was sealed when it left Philadelphia. I didn't want to see her again myself. But there was a funeral. There were flowers. An undertaker. Yes? If they could believe that. If there was one witness, maybe. Maybe my own sister Lizzie. Funeral, Amanda. Of course there was a funeral. The finest funeral in town. A snow-white hearse and twenty-five coaches. Everybody sent flowers. 
the casket wasn't open, but I've been to a lot of funerals where they had a closed casket. And from what I understand, she was pretty badly mangled. But it was a beautiful funeral. Mr. Evans played the organ himself. The finest selections. All the sweet old pieces his wife loved. There was Narcissus, and Mighty Like a Rose, and Goodbye Forever. And that's the way it was. So you see, David, my sister Mrs. Chumley was there. Yes, but how did she know it was Mama? Oh, David. She didn't see Mama, did she? Well, nobody saw your poor Mama, dear. She wouldn't have wanted anyone to see her. Mama wasn't there. She talks to us every night. She tells us to look for her. Where, dear? In the pipes. But, David, your mama's dead. She's been dead nearly a year. Now, you saw her grave out in the cemetery. She's happy and at rest. Why doesn't Papa just give us the key? If you'd only let us have it, we could look for her. What key, dear? The keys to the pipes. There's a little door, just underneath the stairs. That's where the big pipes are. A and inside, it's all dark. But there's tunnels, and a little room. Th that's where Mama is. Oh, David, darling. Look, come here. No, I hate you. But why do you hate me? Why don't you let me help you? Be because, because you like him. Him? Papa, you like him. You're going to marry him, aren't you? Yes, you are. Daphne says you are. You're going to marry him and then you're going to send us back to school. Then there's no one to help Mama. Poor Mama will never be let out. I hate you. I hate you. David, what are you doing? Theodore, it's all right. I'm sure he's very sick. Go to your room at once. Those dreadful children. I tell you, they'll ruin any happiness we might have. Theodore, I love you very much, but I could never marry you. Not with that child's cry ringing in my head. I just couldn't. We've got to help them. Give them that key. Let them look at the room where the pipes are. Then they'll see there's no ghost and it'll be done. A key? Who told you about a key to that room? The children. The children? Amanda, I'm going to tell you something I could never tell another living soul. It may, in fact, frighten you. Yes. Margaret was going mad when she died. No one knew it but me. It ran in her family. I discovered it long after we were married, after the children were born. Otherwise, I never would have... And you think the children? I'm afraid so. It was peopling of sound she had, just like them, a fear of the dead returning. She used to play that... What's that? Sounds like the organ. But the motor isn't on. The console was locked when I left. Someone's trying to play. No one but me can touch that instrument. It's forbidden, and the servants are out. Unless those children come with me upstairs. Theodore, why there's no one here. No one at the keyboard. The organ is playing itself. But that's impossible. The motor's not going. The motor? Yes, the motor. It sets the bellows going. There's no air in the pipes without it going. With no air, there's no way for it to speak. It's impossible, I tell you. Impossible. Perhaps the children found the key and got in. The key? No, no, the key's right here in my pocket. There's no other way in. No! Theodore, open that door. Go in and see what's happening. Please! No. No, I won't give in. I won't be a prey to it. I won't. I won't! <laughs> there. It stopped now. Yes. <laughs> it was probably nothing but the wind. Theodore? Give me the key. I'm not afraid. Are you saying that I am? I don't know. But I'll be fair with you, Theodore. 
I cannot marry you and live here with that any more than your children can. What do you mean, Amanda? Rip out those pipes. Rip out the whole pipe organ. Give it to a church. I don't care. But don't keep it here. Rip out the pipe? Yes. But I can't. The whole house was built around it. It's been the very soul and spirit of this house ever since it was- The very curse, you mean. Theodore, I know I'd go mad, too, if I had to hear it night and day. It's so hollow. Just picturing those pipes so huge in the darkness, I'd begin to hear things, too. the key, if that's the way you trust me. We'll go down and look together. Come now, Amanda. I'm sorry, Theodore. It slipped out. It was a dreadful thing to say. It's all right. I do understand. Yes, it does hurt a little. I've trusted you so completely, Amanda. Theodore, let's not go in there. I do trust you, darling. I believe everything you told me. No. <laughs> to think this little key means so much to you. Oh, look how black it is. Yes, pitch black. And cold. Where are the pipes? I cannot see them. Come in further, Amanda. You'll see them as soon as your eyes grow accustomed to the darkness. The biggest pipes pack this well under the great staircase like giants. Yes, I'm starting to see them now. Shouldn't we go and get a candle? No, no, no. Go in a little further, Amanda. Be careful, though. The floor is a maze of wires. Now, just stand there for a second. Theodore, don't leave me. Oh, I won't be long. I thought you said you weren't afraid. I I'm not. It's just... Where are you going? Oh, just upstairs to play for you. Theodore! I just want you to hear how the music sounds in the darkness. It's quite an experience being so close to the pipes. You know, narrow, suffocating. Especially when I play the great fugue of Bach. Oh, please, Theodore, I don't want to stay here. Or perhaps one of the Rheinberger symphonies, or the great chorals of Caesar Franche. Margaret, of course, preferred Narcissus. Margaret? <laughs> You're very gullible, Amanda. Then you did kill her. You killed her in this room. And you're going to kill me. <laughs> yes, I did. Simple, isn't it? But why? Why? Oh, I don't know. One gets tired of mere music. Sometimes the classics demand competition. A scream, for example. There's nothing so exciting about pulling out all the stops and drowning out all human sound. Have you ever tried to match your voice, Miss Peabody, against the thunderous voice of Bach? And then, when the struggle gets weaker, when the air is almost gone and you choke and gasp for breath, to bring the music down, slowly, softer and softer. You're mad, Theodore. You're mad. Oh, come, Amanda. Would you deny me that pleasure? Oh, help. Help! It takes about eight hours before the air gives out. But you know, I could play for days. And don't worry about the children. I think you've convinced them about the... What's that? Someone's shut the door. The key's outside. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out. I can't breathe. I can't. I... Theodore. Let me out. Let me out. He's dead. He's dead. Daphne. David. Where are you? 
Oh, help! <laughs> May 1st, 1900. I shall be coming home soon, Bessie. I still cannot sleep at night. I still hear that laughter. I still hear that cornet playing its unearthly music and Theodore Evans' lifeless body at my feet. It was his heart, Bessie. He died of fright. In those few moments, he anticipated the cruel fate he had inflicted on so many, and I might have died had he not gone so quickly. The children hated me. They wanted to kill us both. Those terrible, pathetic children. What horrors they must have sensed in that house. There were other women besides his wife. The police had found them all buried and stuffed away in parts of the pipe organ. Bessie, I was in that pipe room alone with him for four hours before the door creaked open. There they stood, and I shall never forget their faces or the things they said. All right, Miss Peabody. You can come out now if you're really sorry. I'm sorry. Are you sure he's quite dead? Yes. We were right, weren't we, Miss Peabody? Yes. Now, can you help us find Mama? And so closes Fugue in C Minor. Originally written by Lucille Fletcher, starring Megan Claude Nicky and A.J. Carey. With the end of that wonderful masterpiece of a radio play, so too ends this season of Retrostatic Radio. However, that does not mean that the show ever truly ends. In two weeks, our very first fan-commissioned episode airs, a phenomenally fun episode of Duffy's Tavern. If you'd like to hear another episode of any of our previously aired shows, then please go to ko-fi.com slash radio to commission an episode. We also have commissions open for the movie specials that'll be airing in a little over a month. Our first is The Maltese Falcon, but after that it could be one of your choosing. Or even if you just want to buy us a coffee, then Kofi is the spot for a one-time donation as well, with our current goal going towards a full website with all the bells, whistles, and even swag. However, if you can't afford it, or you just choose not to go this route, then please remember that sharing is caring, and sharing the show wherever you can, however you can, and following us on all of our social media outlets is free of charge and helps us out immensely. This is the end of today's broadcast. As always, good night and God bless.